Good morning, everyone. I see a good crowd. Uh, so again, I'm Matt. This is Jim. We are core developers on Dask, among others. Uh, we're talking about Dask. Very broadly, Dask is a Python library for parallel computing. It works well on a single notebook and also on a large cluster. Uh, this talk is going to be in three parts. Uh, those parts are roughly, uh, so Dask parallelizes NumPy and Pandas. It provides sort of alternative parallel versions of those libraries. Uh, most of our talks are focused on, on this topic. It's a very sexy, flashy topic. It usually goes over well. Uh, for this crowd, we actually wanted to dive into a bit more of the nitty gritty details of two aspects of Dask. It'll be slightly less flashy, but I think it'll really engage this audience well. Uh, so those two parts are gonna be ad hoc parallel computing. So how do we make parallel programs that don't fit into sort of a big list or big data frame or big array abstraction, which ends up coming up pretty often, especially with library developers. And also distributed computing, which is a new thing for Dask. Uh, I'll talk about the first bit and the last bit. Jim's going to talk about uh, ad hoc parallel computing. So uh, first, though, we're going to do a quick, flashy, distributed Dask data frame bit. So this is pandas running on a cluster. Uh, you can follow along if you want. Uh, if you go to scipy2016.jupyter.org, uh, you can get your very own cluster with eight nodes of two cores each uh, running uh, the notebook I'm about to show. Uh, thanks goes to Ben Zaitlin and uh, Min Regan Kelly for setting it up for us. So, if you press this button, it's a very satisfying button. <laughs> it starts a cluster for you. Give it around 20 seconds. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to do this rather really, really, really briefly. I have a bunch of CSV data on S3 or HDFS or some NFS file system, and I want to read it with pandas. Uh, this is the New York City taxicab data set. It's around 12, it's around 20 gigabytes on disk in a bunch of CSV files, or it's around 60 gigabytes in RAM once it sort of blows up in pandas. Uh, I can read a little bit of it with pandas using the n rows equals five keyword argument, uh, but I can't read it all. It would blow up RAM. So this is a common problem. Uh, fortunately, there's Dask data frame. So Dask data frame is going to load this data for us on a cluster of 10 machines. Each machine is eight cores. What it's doing is it's breaking up those 12 CSV files into 365 little pandas data frames that are uh, loading up across the cluster in RAM on each of my 10 machines. Uh, and the example on the notebook uh, online, there'll just be a one file. You can expand it more if you want. Uh, and while that's happening, we can go ahead and look at what we, what we have. And that object is a Dask data frame, uh, which looks a whole lot like a pandas data frame but is again comprised of 365 pandas data frames on different machines. Now, parallel algorithms are hard sometimes, and Dask data frame is going to do all the coordination of all those pandas data frames for you. So one Dask data frame is one logical collection of many pandas data frames, either on your laptop, on disk, or on a, a cluster of machines communicating over network. You may have noticed this very flashy thing to my right. Uh, this is the, the web UI, you'll be seeing it a bit during the talk. And this is showing the execution of what's happening on our cluster. So I have 80 cores. Uh, so this is you know, from 240 down to 160, and what's happening over time. The purple here was loading data from S3, and the yellow was uh, calling pandas read CSV on those bytes. So you can see what's, as I do things on the left, you can see what's happening on the cluster on the right. It's a nice way to visualize what's happening. Uh, and so you know, this data frame object looks a whole lot like a pandas data frame. Uh, it you know, computes things just about as well. And when we do things like, say, compute the passenger count sum, we're actually computing lots of little small passenger counts throughout the cluster. Uh, this red bit is communicating all of that data back to one machine and computing the sum of sums. Okay. Uh, sum is pretty easy. There's things like group by, which are more complex. Uh, and this goes on pretty, pretty, pretty well. So Dask data frame implements you know, group buys, joins, daytime operations, rolling operations, reductions, uh, element-wise things, a lot of things. Not all things. Things like pivot tables, which are the more exotic functionality of pandas, no chance. Uh, but, uh, so that data frame is really just a bunch of pandas data frames. Uh, it was actually developed alongside a lot of the pandas developers uh, who've done a lot of the work. Uh, Jeff Reebok has done a lot of work on the pandas side. Masakai Horikoshi has done a lot of work on the Dask side. And you can do some you know, fun and exciting computations. Here we're pulling out some bad rows. We're grouping by the hour of day. We're then computing a, a column, a new column, the tip fraction column. So what, how well do New Yorkers tip uh, by hour of day? Do they tip 20% at 5 p.m. or 12% at uh, 4 a.m.? And what you find, very nicely, is that New Yorkers are very, very generous very early in the morning. Uh, they're up to on 38% on average throughout all of 2015. 
Uh, my colleagues in New York City is telling me this is last call at the bars. So, but, you know, band is experience, now in a cluster. We can give a whole talk on this. Uh, we're not going to, because there's other things we should want to talk about. So, DAS was related, oh, there's also this exact same experience exists for NumPy as well. That's actually the first system around. It's very mature at this point. Uh, and also for a list, sort of a PySpark-like thing. Um, DAS has all those, they're nice. Uh, what we found is that in interacting with scientists with more um, interesting workloads or even continuum clients, uh, often they have problems that are definitely very parallelizable, but they don't easily fit into a data frame abstraction or into an array abstraction. They're more uh, custom. And this actually comes up a lot. Uh, you all do a lot of weird things. It turns out this community in particular does just really strange things. Like if you look at how Pandas is used, they're not just using the Pandas API, they're using Pandas API plus a lot of general computation, a lot of general Python around that API. And it's that, that's that general stuff that surrounds Pandas and NumPy that we do that's really hard to capture in sort of the big data tools. And that's really the challenge that we're trying to, to meet. What we found is that, so Dask data frame, Dask array live on top of Dask core. Well, the data frame and the array weren't uh, applicable easily. It was sort of very awkward to shove problems into those abstractions. The core bits were, the scheduler was, and sort of the graph spec were. Uh, so originally, Dask was designed around Dask array. And we had a scheduler, a task scheduler, which we'll talk about in a while. On top of that, we had a specification for how to define task graphs. And on top of that, we built Dask array. And this separation was really nice. It allowed us to very quickly produce Dask bag and Dask data frame afterwards. So we sort of expanded out and sort of this plan to keep building things. But again, we started interacting with lots of people. So some people are totally happy. Climate scientists, atmospheric scientists, anyone dealing with lots of like big arrays, they're extremely happy with this project, especially through the X-Array project from Stefan Hoyer and others. Um, but others, it, this is sort of awkward. We ended up finding that we were just using the, the graph spec and the scheduler and sort of ditching everything else. So what we've done is we made a very small API, Dask Delayed, that was inspired from the Joblib Delayed API, but extended. And on top of that, we've been able to build other libraries. So for example, over the last few weeks, Jim has been building a scikit-learn parallel clone, um, you know, for a subset of scikit-learn. And that's been a lot easier to build than the previous things, because we're now using this Dask Delayed thing. It's a very thin API on top of the scheduler. It's very, very raw. Additionally, there are other things we can build on this. It's now very cheap to build parallel libraries. Uh, this is useful both for scientists doing one-off things. It's also useful for library developers who want to parallelize their libraries. We're, our job is literally to help the scientific Python community parallelize. That's what we get paid for full time. So uh, you all who work on things, who think your libraries should parallelize, think there's a good need for that, please come and talk to us. Okay. Jim just talked about the Dask late for a bit. I'm going to talk about distributed scheduler afterwards. So another thing about Dask is that the separation allows us to switch out schedulers. So Dask is really designed to work on a single machine to sort of unlock the power of your laptop. Your MacBook Pro is way more powerful than a single core. Uh, and now we've, we've switched out to distributed, distributed computing. So we can run on, you know, thousand node clusters. So, okay, I'm now off to Jim. He's gonna talk about Dask delayed. Cool. Uh, thanks, Matt. So uh, as Matt said, we have a new-ish um, API called Dask delayed. Uh, it's really useful for creating arbitrary graphs. You don't have to muck with the graphs themselves. It's a very, very simple interface. Um, it's a little bit like Numba with Numba JIT. Uh, we just have dask.delayed. That's the only function you need. Um, so a single function interface, and it plays really well with existing code with uh, a few caveats. Um, so uh, function, delayed. If you pass it a function, and then you call that function, you get a lazy object uh, that hasn't computed yet. So it's a dask object. And if you call delayed on data, you also get a lazy object that pretends to be your data. So a lot of the methods on it work, um, operators work, uh, but they're all lazy. Uh, and this will be a lot more clear with examples. So uh, this is going to be running the distributed cluster on uh, my local machine. So I've just set this up on my MacBook. Um, oh, let's make that bigger. Wonderful. So. Uh, three functions here, add, mull, and increment. And we've added in a random sleep to make them slower because those are very simple functions. And we'd like them to take some time. So if I call, make it a little bit bigger. If I call add on one and two, uh, x is a delayed object, it's lazy. And if I call compute on it, uh, I get the actual result. So we can chain those. So we can call a couple functions in a row, uh, inc on one, mull on one and two, and then add on the result to both of those. And looking at the graph, you can see kind of get two operations joined together, add at the end, 
and finally call and compute. It runs over here on the distributed scheduler, uh, and we get the result. So d delayed plays really nicely with loops. You can loop over the computation. So here we're going to loop over uh, and do the exact same operations as before, but in a loop. And then at the very end, we're going to sum them all together. Um, here we're calling delayed inline, so you don't have to use this decorator, but you can, um, like we did above. So again, total is a delayed object. Looking at the graph, one really interesting thing here is you can see that this increment call, which we've called four times in a loop, is all being used just once. We do deterministic hashing on our arguments, and so, well, that's what this pure uh, equals true. If you don't want it to do the hashing, you can say pure equals false. But if it's true, it'll share the uh, intermediates, and so it's able to determine we only need to run inc once because inc of one is always the same result. Um, and so that's coming to handy, finding nested shared expressions deep in code that already exists. Um, and again, we can run this. Uh, get a little more complicated, two loops, looping over both parameters. We get a nice bigger graph. Again, this all looks very much like normal Python. You probably have code that looks like this. Uh, and run it. Um, so these are all fairly simple uh, operations. They're very much like the common map things you're familiar with. Something that's a little more complicated would be doing a tree reduction. So here we're gathering all of our results together and bringing them back to one machine to sum them. If those are big, that can be a little bit expensive. So something nice to do would be to gather them in small bits and reduce them so you're not having to send everything to one machine. So that's what a tree reduction is for. So uh, Spark has this, Dask uses this internally, but it's also pretty easy to write up just using some normal Python code. So we're going to loop through grabbing pairs of things, add them together, and then append them to your list, and we're going to keep doing that until the list is only one long. Um, again, this is all normal Python, doesn't look uh, terribly complicated. Uh, and you get a nice big graph, but we're pulling everything together in pairs. And that'll run. So as I said uh, before, there are a couple caveats. Um, it works very well with most code. You cannot uh, use it in a loop. So we can't loop over delayed objects because we don't know how long they are until we've computed them. And you can't use them as case statements, uh, cases and if statements, because we don't know if they're true or false until we've computed them. But everything else, uh, methods, operators, function calls, uh, should just work. Um, and now Matt's going to talk about uh, how the distributed schedule works. So one of the nice things about fast delayed is that there's sort of all the algorithmic powers in your hands. So for example, this tree reduction is something that you know you, a user might ask the, the Dask data frame developers, "Hey, I want tree reductions," and we like to just grumble a little bit and we eventually add it. This is just something I think probably 90% of this room can, after a minute of looking at this code, write it or understand it. it it's very accessible Python. So Dask delayed really lets the algorithm developers think about algorithms and doesn't have to, doesn't force you to think about sockets or resiliency or cluster computing or you know, authentication or whatever. So it's a really nice separation between uh, infrastructure and, and algorithms. So Dask delayed lets you arbitra author arbitrary graphs. And now it's the job of a scheduler to execute them. So this is a trace of the, the single machine threaded scheduler walking through a machine learning graph. And it's tricky. There's actually a lot of things you need to think about here. Uh, so, for example, if I have this very, very simple computation, I have, you know, call f twice, take both of the results, compute them on g, and I have two computers, I may choose, I have some parallelism here, I may choose to run f on the different machines. I then need to move either x to y or y to x, and I might have to look at the size of those data to determine, you know, which one I should move. I should probably move the smaller one. There may be some complications. Maybe f is actually really fast and it's better to run them on one machine. Maybe that there's special hardware involved. Maybe g requires a GPU to make sure that we run g on, say, the right machine. Lots of interesting things that can come up here. So this is the general topic of task scheduling. Dask has had a few different task schedulers. Uh, there's a single machine scheduler, which has been around for a while. Uh, sort of when we first started Dask, this was created. The first one was literally 14 lines long. Uh, it's grown up into a moderate 600 lines of code, which is actually pretty accessible. It's pretty hackable. Uh, and it's been stable for about the last year. There are people running on the Dask scheduler right now. I'm, I'm entirely confident of that. It's, it's under heavy use. And it has not changed that much in about the last year. It's pretty rock solid code at, the point, at this point. Uh, it's intended mostly to minimize RAM to leverage your hard drive. Uh, you can easily process 100 gigabyte data sets as long as you carefully walk through the graph and delete intermediate va va variables as quickly as possible. And the Dask scheduler has lots of heuristics to make sure that we walk through the graph in nice ways. 
uh, it's low overhead, and it's, again, it's hit by a lot of real-world use cases. Dask Ray, Dask Data Frame, the X-Ray community is pretty heavy on this, and, you know, continuum clients and consulting projects. Uh, what's new is a distributed scheduler. This is, started working on this in around September last year. Uh, so the distributed scheduler has three different components. There is a central scheduler, which lives on one computer. There's the client or the user, which is us. We are sort of sitting at our laptops and our Jupyter notebooks. And then there's a lot of workers. So the scheduler coordinates the workers to do this work, and the user, schedule, the user submits little graphs. So here, the client authors some graph. This graph might be authored implicitly through Dask Array or Dask Data Frame. The user doesn't know they're making a graph. They're just sort of hitting compute. The client sends that graph up to the scheduler, and the scheduler farms out that work to the workers. Here we have three tasks that are available. Uh, and we see those tasks are sort of allocated to the worker. As those tasks finish, so blue is when a task finishes, uh, we're able to schedule more work. So the task scheduler is data, is data local aware. So these two tasks finished, and so it knew that this task was available. Those two tasks were on this worker, so it scheduled that extra task to that worker. It's keeping track of where the data is, and trying to minimize data movement. Um, this, the client, I'm not sure if it's easy to see, but there are three little blue circles down here. The client is uh, able to track what's happening on the scheduler real time as the computation is happening. So it's not submit a graph, wait for an answer. It's submit a graph and watch what's happening. And based on what's happening, the client can actually submit other graphs to the scheduler. So the whole thing is asynchronous. There's a real time conversation happening between the scheduler and the client all the time. And we can adapt our computation as it's happening. Uh, and you know, more work can happen. As tasks are no longer needed, as intermediate values are no longer deleted, the scheduler can delete those values, keeping RAM available and free. It's, it's, it's quite good at this because of the history with the single machine scheduler. This is a high priority. The scheduler is multi-user uh, capable. So we have multiple users all hammering on the same compute resources. And everything is nicely shared and also protected. Uh, everything, because everything is hashed, it's very rare to get uh, conflicts. Uh, and you know, there's load balancing, there's work stealing. There's pretty much every optimization you can think of happening that we can do in constant time. So the dynamic scheduler is, uh, is very fast. It runs at around 200 microseconds of overhead per task. It's around 5,000 tasks per second. So if your task takes around one second each, it can, sat it can saturate around 5,000 cores. That's roughly the, the limits. Over time, uh, we compute more and more complex graphs. We do more data science. And the scheduler keeps track of everything. And interesting things happen here. Uh, a, a, the scheduler also does garbage collection. So if a client goes away, it it doesn't want data anymore, uh, the, the scheduler will, will nicely remove the data around and keep everything clean. So it can be running for a long time. Uh, if a worker goes down, uh, we can lose some data. So here we've lost data on the left. Uh, but it's OK because the scheduler uh, keeps track of how to produce that data. It has a plan to rebuild it. And so it can keep building that computation up with the remaining workers. So because it's elastic, it's resilient, it's data local, it's multi-user aware, it's asynchronous. It works well on the traditional Hadoop file system e ecosystem. It also works very well on the traditional high performance computing, uh, traditional cluster computing system. If you have SGE or LSF, it's very, very, very happy. If you have Yarn or an HDFS, you're very happy. It runs well on lots of these things. We're supporting sort of both the traditional scientific community community and the sort of you know, big data Hadoop Spark community. Uh, everything here is pure Python. Uh, so uh, two notes. Um, so it was really, really convenient when we were building this to have Dask Ray and Dask Data Frame and Dask Delayed Around, because we had a huge set of algorithms on which to stress the scheduler from historic single machine use. Uh, and so we've made the scheduler smart enough to handle all these use cases. But it's not optimized for arrays or optimized for data frames. All the optimizations are sort of small scale. And so it's very common now to be presented with a new, completely new algorithm and have everything just work. Because we had to make lots of little small uh, local optimizations and ended up creating, that ended up making arrays and data frames fast. So it's very common to say, I've got this weird problem, and like, ah, just try it, the heuristics will probably work out. Not all the time, but it's pretty good. Uh, it is less concise, it's around a 3,000 uh, line of code Tornado application. This is a slight problem, because this community doesn't have a huge amount of Tornado experience, generally. Uh, there are some counterexamples, a lot of Jupyter is written in, in Tornado, a lot of Bokeh is written in Tornado. Um, we've, we've tried pretty hard to keep all of the, uh, all of the logic bits, like, which worker should this task run on? All of that is sort of tornado free. So it's very hackable. It's intentionally very hackable. Uh, people in this room can make the scheduler better. This is all completely accessible to you. It's pure Python. This is BSD licensed. 
Uh, it's written you know, in Python 2, Python 3, standard library code. Uh, it even runs on PyPy. It's sort of very, uh, very accessible. Okay, it's easy to get started. It's on Condor Forge. It's on the default channels. It's on pip. Uh, you can run it with these two lines. It'll create a local scheduler for you. Or if you want to set up your own scheduler on a, on a, on a, cluster, on a, on a cluster, you just create a Dask scheduler on one machine and Dask workers on the other machines just pointing back to the scheduler. It's, it's, it is easy to deploy. Okay, uh, Jim's now going to give you a last hurrah with machine learning stuff. Okay. Do you uh, need this at all? No, I'm good. I'm good. Um, how are we doing in time? Uh, you're fine. You okay, that's cool. Ooh. Take three minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm gonna something like. Oh, good. Good. That's a lie. Cool. So uh, I'm just gonna quick run all these, um, and we'll talk about them as they run. So uh, this is. I've been spending some time here uh, working on setting up Dask work with Scikit-Learn, uh, and this should be running. Ah, oh, wonderful. Cool. So uh, I've been making a library which lives right here uh, under jchrist slash dask dash learn. Um, it might move over to the dask org very quickly here. It's just a proof of concept. Uh, if you know things about machine learning, please come talk to me. Uh, I would like to get your opinions. Um, this is going to be running. What this is doing is this is running on a local uh, machine we have. Uh, it's 48 cores uh, spread across four different workers. And we're working with the airline data set. So it's flight data from 1987. We're actually looking only at the 2000s. So I've loaded it all from CSVs. I've done some uh, read CSV operations here, little pandas munging. Um, and then doing, uh, here's a little delayed marker here. This is custom work to a one hot categorical encode uh, some of the columns into categories so we can get a big sparse array. Uh, and then down here, this is from the Dask Learn library. We are creating uh, some matrices and then wrapping uh, scikit-learn estimators to do fitting. And then we're actually doing a grid search uh, across multiple machines. And then this is data parallel um, across uh, multiple uh, data frames. Um, and so that's what's going on over here. So we're fitting uh, an SGD classifier, many of them, and then averaging them together. And we're doing this across a grid of uh, alpha and loss and uh, three uh, CSV uh, or CV uh, splits, um, and so I'm just gonna let this run. And at the very end here, we should actually get the result. This plays very well with the Scikit-Learn API. That was what it was designed to match. Um, it's a couple functions long, and uh, this was all written using uh, delayed wherever possible, just to show how flexible uh, Dask can be for non-big collection things. So I'm gonna let this run in the background while Matt uh, concludes here. Okay. So one more minute. Uh, so we saw uh, Dask provides NumPy and Pandas. So how to build ad hoc sort of parallel algorithms using Dask delayed. We saw that those run intelligently on a cluster or on a single machine. Wanted to bring out some, some acknowledgments here. So there's a huge number of people who work on Dask these days, around 70 individuals. Uh, it's really nice. Those individuals are both people submitting random bug reports. There's also a lot of people in this room. We have core library developers from NumPy, from Pandas, from X-Array, from Jupyter, from Scikit-Learn, all very active in the conversations of, this, of the design of this library. It's really been a, a community effort. Uh, there's no way we could have built this stuff on our own. It's really nice. Uh, I also want to thank Continuum Analytics. So it's really nice to work on open source and also get paid for it. Uh, that's, it's a really sweet gig. Uh, we've got a lot of funding historically from, from DARPA, the Exeter program, and we're very excited to announce that we've been chosen, uh, the, the Moore Foundation has generously decided to fund continued work on Dask and on Numba. We're very grateful for that both because it's a good sign of, of funding, which is, which is really important for, for software. It's also a great show of trust. The Moore Foundation is really good to this community historically. And it's really, uh, it's a great honor to be part of that sort of, uh, part of that crowd. So thank you all for the time, your time. There are some Dask stickers uh, around here if you're interested, I'll have some also. Uh, and we'll also be around outside. There's also a continuum happy hour tonight uh, at the offices. So uh, thank you all. Uh, that was the library. Oh, sorry. The, the question is, what is uh, the library I was using for the machine learning stuff? That was the proof of concept machine learning library uh, called Dask Learn. It's up on GitHub. Um, okay, so you, so you imported SKLearn as well. So that's a wrapper around it? Or? 
so the question is, uh, we also use scikit-learn. Um, yes, uh, so Dask array is built using NumPy. We, we compose the algorithms. Uh, Dask learn is built using scikit-learn. It's a thin wrapper around scikit-learn operations. We're just trying to leverage what already exists. Uh, you should come talk to us, yes. and we'll uh, we'll work th work that out. Yeah. Uh, the question is: Are there any restrictions on the kind of functions that Blade should accept? We can accept any Python function. It's up to you to write that Python function. We generally assume that that function is pure and has no side effects. Does that make sense? Yeah. The question is, how easy is it to, for me to add, dynamically add and remove workers? The answer is very easy. You can just make a new worker and point it to the scheduler anytime. You can remove a worker anytime. Yeah, the question is, do we have any, idea, any plans to support GeoPandas? Um, the answer is that we are completely incapable of supporting any library without that library support. So we, we, we needed Jeff Reebok and Masaka Horikoshi to do pandas. We would love to integrate with GeoPandas if those libraries are willing to step up. So please, if you're part of that library, come talk to us. That general invitation goes out to everyone. Uh, so GeoPandas is a really important library. Yeah. So we probably... We probably have time for one more question, but if Bhargava could come up for the next talk, um, and can we get set up, then... Yeah. Back, anyone? Yeah, so the question is, so in the distributed scheduler, Andreas asks, uh, what, parts, what parts are still centralized? So the central scheduler is completely cent cent centralized. The workers are actually quite dumb. The scheduler, it has all the logic. That's entirely in one spot. Uh, if that machine goes down, you've lost all of your work. So it's uh, most sort of, many systems at this scale follow that model. It's not a decentralized system. Yeah. Great, thank you. We'll be outside, and again, at the community happy hour, uh, please come and get to talk to us. We have very fun stickers. They're very new. I'm very excited. You should uh, come get one.